Hi, Dr. McNeil and students. Thanks for sending the excellent questions about COVID-19. Let's go through these. First of all, how do N95 masks work to filter out pathogens and viruses? Do the masks really prevent breathing in PM2.5? So I, that's a great question. I added this to my uh, presentation slides on COVID on viruses in the air. And here is um, the, the question, how do masks work? So there are surgical masks, which are really intended to keep the wearer from spraying droplets onto others. So like if there's someone, a surgeon who is you know, standing over a, an open wound or open cut in a person, the idea is to prevent droplets from spraying out onto someone else. Now respirators are intended to reduce the wearer's exposure to inhaled particles. So that's what we're talking about with the N95. One of the most important things with respirators is that they need to fit correctly. It needs to be a, there needs to be a tight seal around the face because if not, then if there's gaps on the side, then you're just short circuiting and, and unfiltered air can come into your nose and mouth. Um, so you can see in the photos on the right, the person's wearing one upside down. That's a little, the v, little gray V is kind of a metal bendy part that goes around your nose. Um, it looks like in the middle one, she has the straps twisted in the back, and then the last one, she has it pulled down over her neck, which of course doesn't help at all. The way that filters work is not just by straining or sieving out particles that are larger than the holes. Um, they work, first of all, by impaction. So if you think about um, the air flowing past a fiber, you can see the fiber is the collector there. We're looking at it kind of end on. And impaction is when these particles are kind of going along the streamlines, you can see the uh, this white one, clear one, and as the streamline bends around the, the fiber, the collector, the uh, momentum of the, the inertia of the particle means that it keeps going straight. It kind of deviates from the streamline and it crashes into the fiber and is collected or removed. Um, the second process is through interception. So if the streamline passes close enough, you can see this large black particle um, kind of uh, intersects, bumps into the collector on the way past, and so it gets removed. And then finally, there's diffusion, where very small particles have random motion, Brownian motion, uh, because they're being bumped into by gas molecules, and that can cause them to bump into the collector and be removed. The efficiency of these, each of these mechanisms is a function of particle size. And you can see that, for example, for we talked first about impaction, and so that is good so the y-axis here is collection efficiency. That's pretty good for particles that are greater than maybe 0.7 microns or so. Um, of course, it depends on the exact uh, specifications of the filter that you're using. But then as you go to smaller particles, the collection efficiency drops down to zero. For interception, um, that's this long dash line, and that has follows a similar pattern. Um, but for diffusion, the collection efficiency is actually very high for particles that are smaller than, quite a bit smaller than 0.1 microns, and then the efficiency falls off as you get towards larger particle sizes. Uh, sedimentation refers to gravitational settling, which really is, uh, only matters for pretty large particles. You can see larger than a, a few microns. Now, if we add these different efficiencies up, you can see the total, which has this U shape with a dip, kind of somewhere between 0.1 and 0.3 microns, where no collection mechanism works well. Um, and so an N95 is defined as one, a mask that blocks at least 90%, 95% of the particles that are of diameter 0.3 microns. And that doesn't mean that it's ineffective for smaller particles. Remember, those would be collected by diffusion. So the removal efficiency is even better for particles that are greater than 3 microns and particles that are less than 3 microns. Um, and the capture efficiency depends on size and density of the particle. And it should be the same whether the particle contains a virus or not. The next question is, how long after breathing in a virus are you able to spread it by coughing and sneezing? So when you, if you breathe in a virus, it actually would need to um, replicate in your cells to make more viruses that could then, that would then be released into your respiratory fluid. And I don't know how long that takes. We know that the incubation period for COVID-19 seems to be up to two weeks, so um, I'm not sure. I know that there was a study looking at virus shedding, and they found that uh, people without symptoms, asymptomatic patients, were shedding, and there seemed to be the most shedding right at the beginning of the disease before the symptoms became um, much more than a cough. 
Okay, the third question is, do you think in the cases of clusters like the Biogen meeting and the Korean church clusters that transmission was likely due to an airborne virus? So when you have, you know, a lot of people easily getting sick quickly, it's, that's an indicator that the, the virus is spreading through the air. I think the fact that we are getting so much transmission so fast, just in the population at large, is also another clue. Um, there's not there's not actually a distinction, hard distinction between a virus that's airborne and not. There's there's kind of multiple different transmission routes. There are some things that are clearly only bloodborne, like HIV. But respiratory viruses, anything that gets into the air, or whether it's in it, it is it's going to be in droplets and aerosols of a wide variety of sizes, and whether it's so they're all in air. Um, the question is whether it can spread easily by air, which depends on how much virus the infected people are shedding, how long that virus can last, can, um, main, can be maintain its viability or its ability to infect in the environment, um, and then how much really how much people are exposed to it, and then how much how many viruses they need to be exposed to uh, to make them sick. The fourth question. Why is the social distancing guideline of maintaining a six foot distance from others the same indoors and outdoors? Um, it's a good question. I think uh, there's usually much more dilution outdoors. And so you maybe could have a slightly shorter distance outdoors, or maybe we should have a longer distance indoors. But I think that guideline is um, six feet under all conditions just for simplicity. So there's a lot of, uh, I guess, complexities about public health messaging that I don't, I don't fully appreciate. But um, from the experience I have had, I know that um, simpler is better. And people want like kind of definite, actionable items. They don't, it's, it's harder for people to handle, oh, well, you have this kind of varying level of risk. Some things are more riskier than others. People want a hard answer or firm answer. Um, so is it really risky to be within three to six feet of others on a sidewalk in the fresh air? Uh, think of it as cigarette smoke. You don't want to be near someone who's smoking or be in that puff of smoke. So I kind of use that as my guideline of how far to stay away from people. All right. Thank you.